Hi, my name is Michael Dickinson. I'm a professor of biology and bioengineering at the California Institute of Technology. And this is the second in a series of lectures on how flies fly. In the first lecture in this series, I discussed how flies are able to make aerodynamic forces by flapping their wings. And in the third lecture, we're going to focus on how flies are able to control flight using sensors and other, uh, other strategies. But in this lecture, I want to focus on the question of power. How flies and other insects are able to generate enough force to flap their wings back and forth as they fly. So if you were to design an insect, you might have designed something a bit like this, which is actually pretty much how modern-day dragonflies work. You would build up a series of muscles that might be attached to the base of the wings. And as the muscles contract back and forth, they flap the wings in a reciprocal fashion, like so. But it turns out that most insects don't actually operate in this simple way. And the reason has to do to the fact, ultimately, is that they're small. And as a consequence, their muscles have to function quite differently. So to consider this, let's review some basic cell biology and how a muscle is activated by its motor neuron. So the motor neuron, which would be in our bodies, in the spinal cord, generate electrical impulses called action potentials. And they propagate down an axon where the spike then, through a synapse, causes an electrical event in the muscle itself. And this generates a pretty complicated cascade of events in which the membrane of the muscle depolarizes, and it activates a specialized channel uh, called a dihydropyridine receptor, which allows calcium to flow from an internal store called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the main goal of this electrical event is to allow calcium to flood the muscle cell. And it's the calcium that then activates the contractile apparatus, the myosin and actin, that causes the muscle to contract. Now, why is it so hard for small insects to generate sufficient power to fly? Well, it all really comes down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a giant storage vehicle for calcium. And when the calcium is released, it floods the internal cell space very, very quickly because it's driven by confusion, diffusion. There's a lot of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so when you allow the calcium to flow out, it flows out very quickly. And muscle force develops very, very rapidly. Now, the problem is, how do you turn the muscle off? You have to turn the muscle off by pumping the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is what takes both energy and time. And this is why, when you record a muscle twitch, forces are generated very quickly, but they turn off very, very slowly. So now let's consider how this affects insect flight. What I'm plotting here is the wing beat frequency used by insects of different sizes. Large insects, such as locusts, can flap their wings very, very slowly at a frequency of about 10 hertz, whereas insects like tiny gnats have to flap their wings very, very quickly at frequencies in excess of 1,000 hertz. Now, this causes large consequences for the way that muscles work. And the reason why there's this difference in flapping frequency really comes down to the aerodynamics, which I talked about in my first lecture. Insects are able to fly because they generate this structure called a leading-edge vortex, this swirly source of circulation, which is developed every time the insect flaps its wing through the air. However, for small insects, the air gets relatively more and more viscous. It's stickier, and it's harder for that leading-edge vortex to develop. And as a consequence, the leading-edge vortex is smaller, and the amount of force it generates is smaller as well. The only solution for the insect is to flap its wings very, very quickly to generate as much velocity as it possibly can. And this means that its muscles have to operate very, very, very quickly. Now, if we look at the up and down motion of the wing of a locust, there's plenty of time in each half stroke for the muscles to operate. So what I'm plotting here in red would be the force generated by a downstroke muscle. So the force could be very high during the downstroke. The force could be very weak during the upstroke, because during the upstroke, the downstroke muscles don't want to fight against the, the other muscles in the system.
Now consider the same situation for a tiny gnat that's flapping its wings very, very quickly. If we just took a locus muscle and put it in a gnat, the problem would be that that muscle would not turn off quickly enough. So in other words, the downstroke muscle would still be active during the upstroke, which would make it very difficult for the upstroke muscles to function. What you need for a insect to flap its wings quickly is a muscle that's very, very fast. Now remember, I told you that the the speed with which a muscle can deactivate is really related to the amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum, this internal storage space that stores the calcium and is also the surface by which the calcium is pumped back out of the cell. And one of our solutions would be to just fill the cell with a lot of sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that could make a muscle that's very, very fast. You could generate force during the the downstroke, turn off during the upstroke. But the problem is, because so much of the internal volume is now sarcoplasmic reticulum, there's not enough room left over for the actin and myosin, the proteins that are actually generating force. So you end up with a muscle that's very, very weak. So this is a a fundamental problem that muscles have, it's very difficult to be both fast and be strong. And what the insects really need in order to fly is power. How do they solve this problem? Well, insects have evolved, and possibly as many times as four independently, they've evolved a special type of muscle called asynchronous muscle. And I'll show you in a little bit why it's called asynchronous muscle. But the important thing to note about this muscle compared to good synchronous twitch muscle, like the muscles in our limbs, is that asynchronous power muscle of insects has almost no sarcoplasmic reticulum in it at all. The entire internal volume is filled with what you imagine you'd need for power, which are the proteins that are generating the force and the mitochondria that that are producing the energy. And the way this muscle works is that the contraction cycles are not actually activated on a cycle-by-cycle basis by electrical events coming from the nervous system. So if we plot, again, the muscle of a locus, what we find is that each cycle of of up-and-down motion is controlled by a single spike in the muscle. Whereas if we look at what's going on in an asynchronous flyer, such as a beetle or a fly, the wings beat back many, many, many times. You get many patterns of oscillation for every every spike. This is why it's called an asynchronous muscle, such that the electrical events in the muscle are decoupled from the mechanical events in the muscle. And the way this actually works is, is that you have two sets of muscles that stretch activate one another. So you have downstroke muscles that when they contract, they move the wings forward. Those downstroke muscles run basically from the head towards the abdomen. And when they contract, they stretch another set of muscles, the um, upstroke muscles, which run dorsal ventrally. And it's that mechanical stretch that activates them. That drives the wing backwards. But as those muscles contract, they stretch the downstroke muscles, and so the cycle continues. So these sets of muscles, these upstroke and downstroke muscles, are able to self-actuate self-activate one another as the animal is is flapping. And this system operates at very, very high frequencies without the need for barely any sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these muscles can generate enormous amounts of power. Even though the power muscles of flies and other insects are stretch activated and are activated by each other, the downstroke muscles activate the upstroke muscles, the upstroke muscles activate the downstroke muscles, the nervous system of the fly can still regulate things to some degree. And this is done by changing the amount of calcium that's in the muscles. So the calcium is basically determining the stretch activation state of the muscles. And so by activating the muscles a little bit higher frequency, you can produce a... uh, muscle that is more uh, actively stretch activated. If you have less calcium in the muscle, you have a muscle that's slightly less stretch activated. So this functions something like a throttle that the insect can use to power up or power down during flight. Now, how is it that muscles are stretch activated? This is not a typical thing for uh, uh, muscles of vertebrates or insects. And we don't really understand the molecular mechanisms that allow a muscle to turn on when it is stretched compared to turn on in the presence or absence of calcium. But what you do find within the sarcomere, that is the functional unit of muscle, specialized proteins 
that you don't find in, in, in typical muscles such as in our own bodies. So we believe that it's really the specialization of these particular proteins that allow these muscles to be stretch activatable, which is, allows the insect to use them to generate large amounts of power during flight. So the power muscles are really one key to the story. They allow insects, particularly small insects, to generate enough power to flap their wings back and forth. But an interesting thing about the power muscles is that they're not actually directly connected to the wings. And they don't allow the insect to regulate the motion of the wings on a stroke-by-stroke basis. So the other half of the equation is another set of muscles that we call steering muscles. And these are very, very tiny muscles that insert directly on little tiny skeletal elements at the base of the wing. And although they're very small, they're controlled on a cycle-by-cycle basis. That is, they're good twitch muscles. And the nervous system can use these muscles to regulate all the maneuvers that the insect needs when it's in the air. So the base of a typical insect wing has a series of four hardened elements called sclerites. And at the base of each sclerite, there are several groups of muscles that pull on the little skeletal element and distort the way that the wings move back and forth during each cycle. It's not really important to know the names of these muscles, except to understand that there's four groups, and each group is controlling one of these four skeletal elements. Now, unlike many of the muscles in our bodies that are controlled by many, many motor neurons, each one of these steering muscles is regulated by one and only one excitatory motor neuron each, which means that the amount of neural hardware that's going into controlling insect flight is remarkably sparse. If we were to record from one of these muscles during flight, we'd see something like this. This is recording from a muscle called the first basilar muscle. And what's shown here is an electrophysiological recording that's coming from a sharp electrode that's implanted in the muscle at the same time that we're taking a high-speed video of the flapping fly. And this muscle is firing a single action potential every time the fly flaps its wings back and forth. And it's doing so at exactly the same or almost the same point in the stroke cycle. So this is a typical firing pattern for some of these steering muscles at the base of the wing. Now, how is it that a muscle that's operating so quickly is able to reconfigure the hinge of the wing, allowing the wing to beat in a different way, which, of course, allows the fly to generate different aerodynamic forces, which would allow it to generate some sort of maneuver? So to understand how these steering muscles work, we use a technique that's called the work loop analysis that was developed initially by insect physiologist named Bob Josephson. And what you basically do in a work loop analysis is to put the muscle of the fly or the other animal in a little jig that allows you to oscillate the muscle back and forth very, very quickly, exactly as it is in the body of the animal when it's flying or walking. At the same time, you can measure the forces generated by the muscle, and you can stimulate the motor neuron that's going to the muscle. So the results of a typical experiment might look something like this. You measure, you imply, uh, rather, impose a length change on the muscle, an oscillatory uh, length change, and you measure the forces generated by the muscle. And we call, in physiology, we typically call these changes in length strain and these changes in force stress. And if we were to plot the stress and strain as the muscle oscillates back and forth, we'd see that the data look look like this. The muscle, uh, as as you increase the strain, the stress goes up, and you decrease the strain, the stress goes down. But it does so with a certain amount of hysteresis, which means that the muscle is absorbing energy. This is basically the same results that you would record if you put a rubber band into your apparatus instead of a muscle. Now, if you were to uh, activate the muscle physiologically by stimulating the motor neuron that goes to the muscle, you might get a different result because the muscle generates higher stress. So that would be as if you were recording from a stiffer rubber band. Now, if you stimulated the muscle at exactly the right time, in particular, when the muscle was beginning to shorten, you might have the situation 
where the muscle is generating more stress as it's shortening than it is when it's being lengthened. So what this basically means is the muscle is doing more work during shortening than the work you have to do or the other muscles would have to do when it was intact in the animal as the muscle is lengthening. So it's doing positive work. This means that the muscle is basically acting like a motor. And this is the way that our muscles work in our legs when we're running or in our arms when we're swimming. However, what's really interesting about these steering muscles of the fly is that they're oscillating at such a high frequency that they never do positive work. They never function as motors. So how is it that they could function at all? Well, by regulating the phase at which they're activated, the nervous system is able to change the stiffness of the muscle. So in effect, the nervous system is using these muscles as little tiny controllable springs, the stiffness of which they can regulate on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis. So you can think of the fly as having a bunch of controllable springs at the base of its wings, and this is how the animal is able to steer and maneuver during flight. So by changing the activation phase, that is, when the muscle is activated in each cycle, the nervous system control can regulate the stiffness of the muscle, and that changes how the effects the muscles have on the stroke cycle. So to see how this would actually function in, a, in an actual fly, what I'm showing you are some data in which we're recording the electrical activity in one of the steering muscles at the same time that we used high-speed video to look at the motion of the wing um, back and forth within the stroke cycle. And for most of the time, this muscle, because I put a little black dot when the muscle was active in each stroke cycle, the muscle is active right at the upstroke to downstroke transition. And during that time, the wing follows a particular trajectory within the stroke cycle. However, when that muscle fires a little bit earlier, it becomes a little bit stiffer. It's a stiffer spring, and as a consequence, the wing follows the trajectory indicated in blue. And if the muscle fires even earlier, as indicated by the red dot, so these are just a few stroke cycles where the muscle is firing very early, it develops much higher stiffness, and as a consequence, the wing is pulled into an even larger change in stroke amplitude. So by controlling the relative stiffness of these little tiny muscles in the base of the wing, the insect is able to control its flight motor, and in particular, the, the power that's generated by the power muscles. So the important thing is to, is to note that what's, what's really controlling the motion of the wings are little tiny changes in phase of activation of the muscles. If the muscles are activated a little bit earlier in the cycle, the muscles are stiffer. If the muscles are activated a little later in the cycle, they're more compliant. And those changes in stiffness are important for the steering maneuvers. So that's just a story on one muscle. And, and those recordings were very, very difficult to make because they required putting an electrode in these little tiny muscles at the base of the wing. I mean, when I say little, I mean they're basically like tendons with an attitude. What do we know about the other steering muscles at the base of the wing? Well, this is where some technology that's available in fruit flies has really come in handy. And it's possible through genetic techniques that I don't have time to go into, it's possible to express within all the steering muscles of the wing a specialized protein that's called G-CAMP that changes its fluorescence in the presence of calcium. And if we put this protein in the muscles, it's actually possible, because the changes in fluorescence are so strong, to visualize the activity of the muscles directly through the cuticle of the animal, directly through its skin, in effect. And that's what's shown in, in, in this movie. And what you should see are little bright uh, uh, regions that are either on all the time or flashing on and off um, as this animal, which is actually flying in a little uh, flight simulator, it's tethered to a little stick. Um, we're letting it play a little video game, and all the while seeing how it's turning these steering muscles on and off. And when we look at that pattern of activity within these groups of steering muscles, we see a, 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 a rather um, interesting pattern, that many of the muscles are active all the time. These were the muscles that in that video you saw were bright um, almost continuously with little tiny modulation. There's another set of muscles, however, that were blinking on and off. We call the muscles that are on all the time the tonic muscles, 
and the muscles that blink on and off, the phasic muscles. And they play two slightly different roles in controlling the pattern of wing motion. Now, if I was to enlarge the time base um, of such a trace, as is shown here, you can see that uh, the phasic muscles are usually silent, but they're, they're turning on every time the fly tries to steer. And those steering um, <clears throat> maneuvers are indicated by the top trace, which is plotting the uh, difference in wing stroke amplitude of the left and right wing. So what we really have here is a very sophisticated system in which we have four skeletal elements at the base of the wing. Each one of those skeletal elements distorts the wing in a different way, and each one of those skeletal elements has a tonic muscle that's always active in making modifications, and a phasic muscle that can be recruited when the fly wants to do something quickly. So what we believe is happening is that each one of those skeletal elements has a different effect on the pattern of wing motion. And and through all the changes that are enabled by those uh, four skeletal elements, the fly can do everything it needs to do to steer and maneuver. So again, we have these tonic muscles that are on all the time. Their activity is being controlled by phase. And we have phasic muscles that are recruited uh, sporadically when the fly really wants to, 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 to do something dramatic while it's in the air. So just to give you a little bit more sense of how that works, let's look at a high-speed video sequence of a fly that's being uh, chased effectively by an electronic fly swatter. It performs a very, very fast maneuver. Now, you might think that in order to steer so rapidly, the fly has to do something dramatic with its pattern of wing motion. But that's not actually the case. That this rapid change in flight maneuver that's shown in this photo montage of that sequence was actually produced by remarkably subtle changes in wing motion. And so through high-speed video that involves multiple cameras, it's possible to quantify the changes in wing motion produced by that steering maneuver and others like it. And there's ch changes in the pattern of stroke angle, which is the motion of the wing back and forth. There's changes in the angle of attack. And there's changes in stroke deviation, how much the wing moves above the stroke plane. And it turns out that that rapid maneuver is produced by very, very subtle changes in the deviation of the stroke. And these changes are produced by these phasic muscles that can be recruited when the fly wants to do something quickly. In contrast, imagine this poor fly, poor because we've cut half of its wing off. Nevertheless, it's able to fly stably through the air. But it can only do so because the intact wing and the, the damaged wing are producing very large changes in motion that are continuous. So if we were to look at the changes in the intact wing relative to the damaged wing, we find large, consistent changes that the animal has to maintain basically as long as it flies. And this is a common problem for insects because like this poor monarch butterfly, if an insect damages its wings, it can never repair them. It only gets one set of wings that it has to use for its entire life. So what we think these two systems allow the animal to do is to uh, generate rapid maneuvers. This is what the phasic muscles are, are, are basically responsible for. Um, in addition, it's able to make sort of constant changes that can trim out any differences that the insect might have in the area of its wings, wing damage, or even the physiology, the functions on the left side of the body or the right side of the body. So before, um, before stopping, I just want us to think a little bit about flies compared to other flying animals. So what you see here in these high-speed video is food going into the mouth of a hummingbird and food coming uh, basically um, out of the abdomen of a, of a fruit fly. But the aerodynamics by which these animals are staying in the air is extremely similar. They both involve the leading edge vortex that you can, you can hear about in my first lecture. So from an aerodynamic spec perspective, they're basically similar little machines. But this hummingbird has several thousand motor neurons that it's using to control the motion of each wing. But via the system of power muscles and steering muscles, the fruit fly is able to achieve similar functionality with on the order of, of 10 motor neurons, uh, orders of magnitude fewer. And this is one of the things that I think is so fascinating 
about flies. So that's it for this lecture on power, where we focus on the muscular control of the flapping motion of the, of the wing. If you want to learn more about the aerodynamics, you can look at my, for my first lecture in this topic. And the le next lecture in this series, we're going to move on to the question of how the fly actually controls the aerodynamic forces in order to perform complex behavioral tasks.